Thank you all for being here. And um, this is a picture of the building where Amnet offices, Trussell Building, built in 1899. Really cool office space. Come visit us sometime. We do margaritas with staff on, uh, on Fridays at 3.30. So come have a margarita with us. They're good margaritas. Where are you located? <laughs> 219 <laughs> West Colorado. Uh, I can see it from the balcony. Okay. We're that close. I'm going to talk to you today about cybersecurity officer training and why every business should have somebody who's designated for that role. So we're going to talk about what is a cybersecurity officer, security landscape today, the wall, which Michael's going to cover, company responsibilities, cybersecurity policies, and cyber insurance. And then we'll do some Q&A. If there's something that you just got to ask in, in the middle, stop me and, and I'll do what I can to answer your questions. I'll probably deflect anything hard to Michael, though. <laughs> so your doctor's office, your dentist's office, each of them has got a HIPAA compliance officer. And usually it's not somebody who's necessarily medically trained. It's not a doctor. It's usually like the office manager or even the receptionist. And it's their job to make sure that they're following HIPAA best practices and procedures, and they're accountable in their organization to make sure those things happen. Um, also, if, you're, if you've got HIPAA requirements, you've got to do six audits per year. And it's not all IT. A lot of it is just process and procedure. So we think it's equally important to, for any business to have somebody who's maintaining a culture of safe computing in your business. Uh, we are a big proponent of user awareness training. And if we've got someone in-house who's making sure that everyone's been through the user awareness training, it'll help protect the business a whole lot more than if you don't. Really, most breaches occur because an employee clicked on a PDF file or a link. So, oh yes, yeah, some of the biggest infections are PDFs, and if your Adobe isn't updated, okay. you're really vulnerable. Um, executive buy-in on this is critical. Not even just buy-in, but if the people at the top are not, what, what was the phrase that you used? Fully committed. So I, I, yeah. If they're not just passionately committed to make sure that the company is following these processes, uh, your cybersecurity officer is not going to get the kind of support that they need to have. We're going to cover, talk about this a couple times. The people at the top absolutely need to be leading the charge on this. So, and knowing when to alert your IT support is also an important thing. Whether you've got, you've got something going on that just feels fishy, uh, it's okay to reach out to whoever does your IT, whether you've got an in-house IT provider um, or an outsourced IT provider. So the company that I founded, Amnet, that's what we do. We do IT support for businesses with 20 to 400 employees. So um, we will work alongside your cybersecurity officer if you're a client to keep them trained up and give them tools to do that role, uh, it, particularly the user awareness training. So good cybersecurity is, is kind of like mountain climbing. So if you go mountain climbing and you go buy all these tools, but you don't know how to use them, odds are you're not going to come back. Uh, there's certainly yeah. examples. There was an example of uh, these Sherpas who were taking people up Mount Everest. And these Sherpas were competing with each other on who could get the most people up in a month? And despite having all kinds of tools and training, they started taking shortcuts. And a storm came in, and eight people, including some very experienced climbers, died as a result. So we're going to talk about what some of those different tools are. Mike, you want to weigh in on the mountain climbing? Yeah, I mean, really, um, you know, to, to kind of liken it to uh, you know, uh, 
not only do you know how to mountain climb, but you know how to effectively use the tools that are at your disposal to do it safely. And so, you know, a cybersecurity practice is much of, of the same. It's not only having the knowledge uh, of, of, of how to practice uh, good cyber hygiene or any of those other things, but also knowing how to use the tools that you have at your disposal uh, to, to help make the process better. And we'll talk more about what some of those tools and layers are in a, in a few more slides here. So I'm going to talk a, a couple of minutes uh, about, uh, and, and we're going to reference it relatively heavily uh, throughout the presentation because they really do do some good work. Uh, Verizon puts out annually a data breach investigations report uh, where they come out with, uh, here are, are a lot of the data breaches that we helped investigate and here are some of the metrics around them. Um, and so from the 2015 one, they, they had uh, uh, called out some really good metrics uh, uh, around how quickly and how uh, attackers are able to uh, breach organizations. So 60% of the time, attackers are able to compromise an organization within minutes. And what that means is, so if it's a compromise delivered via email or anything like that, after it's executed, it only takes them um, a couple of quick minutes to actually gain a foothold inside of your organization. Uh, to, to be able to, to actually start doing things. 23% of recipients now open phishing messages, uh, and 11% click on attachments uh, with those, those email messages. And so one of the things here is to highlight that it's not necessarily a technology problem uh, at its core, but it's more of a user education and people process uh, issue uh, uh, to be able to train your folks. 50% of open emails, 50% open emails and click on phishing links within the first hour. And so, you know, uh, the, the time to turn around. So if you look at, you know, they click on it in the first hour and it only takes a couple minutes to gain a foothold inside your organization, you know, from launch of attack to actually getting foothold can be inside that hour. All right, so the security threats have been going up dramatically uh, in the past few years. And for a small business, it really did used to be enough to have a firewall and some antivirus, maybe some spam filtering. But today, that is far from enough to deal with the threats that are out there. The hackers out there today, they're international, they're smart, and they're persistent. You know, it used to be people would write viruses for notoriety. Uh, the I love you virus, the Melissa virus, the NIMDA virus, those were some of my favorites. And uh, even though we had to deal with them, we also kind of had a, a respect for these virus writers when they came up with a good one. But what people have done is they've taken those skills and discovered that they can make money writing malware. And in particular, while they used to target organizations to try and find some data that's worth selling, what they discovered is your information is valuable to you, even if it's not valuable to someone else. And if they can keep you from it, you'll pay them to get it back. And that's kind of the core of what happens with ransomware. Uh, there's certainly more visibility. And it doesn't matter what size company you are. Chances are they're scanning IP addresses, looking for holes in your firewall. I would liken that to a crook in a, park, in a mall parking lot at Christmas time, jiggling door handles, looking for that unlocked car where there's presence in the back seat. That's what hackers are doing when they're scanning a broad range of IP addresses. They're just jiggling those door handles. So some examples of breaches in our backyard. Have you guys heard about Colorado Timberline? They're a publisher in Denver. I'm going to talk a little bit about that here. And we're going to look at a Pew Pew map. And an example from this month of a phishing scam that hit really close to home for me. So a lot of businesses think we're too small to get hacked. Not true. Um, cyber criminals behind ransomware do not particularly care who their victims are as long as you're willing to pay them. 
So Colorado Timberline, it's a publishing company up in Denver. Approximately 100 employees. I've seen a wide range of, of how many staff they may have had, but um, approximately 100 employees. They had a ransomware attack August 14th that kept them from their data. And a month later, they were out of business and all those people were out of work. Did not take long for this business to die. So we're talking about hacking attempts. This is, uh, Riggs, why don't you tell yeah. them all about this? So actually, uh, this, is, uh, this is just kind of a fun eye chart. Uh, you can look at it. Um, you see a whole bunch of different countries uh, here. And uh, I can vouch India, uh, China. from the, uh, uh, the purchase security side. So you have Argentina, you have the Republic of Korea, you've got China up there. Uh, hey, look, New Jersey's there. Um, it's, it's probably about as bad as China uh, for the most part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, Cairo, uh, uh, Romania, a lot of Eastern Bloc countries, uh, or, or, or former uh, uh, Eastern Bloc Soviet countries, uh, are on this list. Uh, and, you know, countries that aren't necessarily friendly to uh, 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 U.S. policy. But what this shows is this is a firewall log of a, a firewall that just sits external um, and just a couple minutes worth of, of, of activity that goes on at any given time. Uh, adversaries are always scanning uh, for, for, uh, for uh, uh, targets of opportunity. Um, and when they find something, they'll try to knock a little harder and see if they can brute force their way into it. So this is just a little bit of an eye chart to show that uh, a lot of these things uh, are, are borderless. Um, additionally, uh, you can see down at the bottom uh, a lot of attempts to try default credentials. So root, admin. Uh, you've got uh, tries at one, two, three, four, five, six. Guest. Uh, Student. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, more or less uh, them trying uh, an educated guess at a username and password combination to try to break into the assets that they're scanning against. Absolutely. Yeah, the vast majority of those are just going to be, you know, uh, again, something running automated in the background, uh, you know, likely from a compromised server somewhere else. Uh, and then when it finds something juicy, it's going to escalate it to a real life squishy human being to try to go ahead and uh, exploit it. So what this is here, uh, so I always make fun of these as pew pew maps. Um, they make, uh, really good eye candy to put in front of uh, executive management, things like that, uh, to show in real time that, I mean, there is a, 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 an absolute volume of information going across the internet at any given time. And this is just a small subset of things that could be identified as being malicious uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the daily internet traffic. And so, I mean, you can see here that, you know, as the countries scroll by, and the types of exploits that they're trying, again, the automated scans, uh, it truly is you know, just a, a constant thing. So you can see where some of these uh, attacks are originating from. We've got China, Eastern Bloc, but even you know, here in, in Brazil, Argentina, and even attacks where computers within the United States are attacking other computers within the United States. And you can certainly notice some hot spots We've got Southern California, we've got Redmond, New York. You think that's Kansas City where that is? I'm thinking that that is probably just the geographic center of the United States. All right. Uh, and so just no, no associated uh, additional information beyond, beyond that. So anyhow, real time, what's going on? All kinds of attacks. 91 minute phishing example. Two weeks ago. My father received this email message. And it looked like it was from me. Uh, so he responded. He's available at 1045. And then this scammer 
said, I need you to get some gift cards. I need to send them out in less than 45 minutes so I can tell you which product we'll need and what amount. It's like, online or whatever. Uh, scammer said, I want you to buy them and send me the codes. What I need is Google Play gift cards, $2,000 worth. Scratch the back out and send me the codes on this email chain. Who sells them? You can get them in Walmart. So he went to Walgreens and Safeway. So about this time, I'm on the golf course. And I get uh, this message from Dad. Walgreens would only sell me seven. Now I'm at Safeway. They're selling me 13. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he went on to say he had the $20, $100 Google Play gift cards. And I said, still unsure why you're telling me. I really thought he was meaning to text mom, not me. I'm not sure why he's buying Google Play gift cards, but I'm on the golf course and I didn't put a lot of thought into it. Um, and then he says, card info sent. So he sent this stack of codes from those $2,000 worth of Google Play cards to the scammer. And from the time the first email came in, 9.43, to the time he got them sent at 11.14, 91 minutes had passed, and my dad was out $2,000. My dad's son owns an IT company. <laughs> uh, so how could this have been caught sooner? First of all, this is clearly not my email address. Uh, my father's known me for 46 years. 47 next week. <laughs> and he ought to know the tone of how I write and speak. For me to have a subject line of urgent matter and then a typo of we have some few clients we want to send a gift. Um, not capitalizing so, and then so can I tell you which product we will need and what amount. Clearly this, this scammer's first language is not English. Probably not someone in the United States, probably not someone Colorado Springs Police Department or the FBI can actually do anything about. And then no actual email signature. All my emails have a signature. They sure don't say sent from my iPad. Now hindsight's 20-20. But I sure wish when I got this message on the 17th tee box that I'd actually called him and said, what are you talking about? Because at least at that point, he hadn't sent the codes yet. Um, lesson learned for me. So there's an example from just this month that hit really close to home. Yes? No, you, you had a lot of agreement <laughs> nods. <laughs> yeah. So we do user awareness training for all of our uh, clients that use our cybersecurity package. So, and actually before I dig into this slide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback off of Trevor's story here a little bit. You know, I mean, everybody does receive these, these messages and you know, these scammers send out thousands of them. The thing is, is it's really low overhead for them to send out thousands and all they have to do is get lucky once. Um, you know, and, and in this case, they got lucky once and you know, there are countless instances of where they do continue to get lucky. And so 
um, again, driving home that user awareness training and all of those other pieces. Uh, you know, another really good example uh, is, and, and, and they're not nearly as, uh, as evident as, you know, horrible spelling and things like that, but it, uh, uh, I know of a mortgage company uh, that works with, you know, title companies just like every other mortgage company does, and title companies tend to not have as good information security practices as a mortgage company or a bank or, or somebody who would be FFIEC regulated would. Well, that title company's job is to escrow an absolute boatload of money on behalf of the mortgage uh, company and the buyer of the property or the seller of the property. There are documented instances of title companies getting compromised, their actual emails getting compromised, and they'll send the banks or the mortgage companies updated wiring instructions. And they'll do this uh, at a point, so, you know, a good example, Friday before Christmas. Say, hey, I know we're closing, you know, next Monday, Christmas is coming up, here's all the updated stuff, go ahead and, you know, if you want to get it wired out so it's there for closing on Monday, go ahead and do it. And then here's all the updated stuff. They're using the title company's letterhead. They're using the title company's email account because it's been compromised. All of these things and the bank updates, the wiring instructions, sends it off somewhere else. And come Monday morning, there's a quarter million dollars missing from the title company's account that should have been there, uh, but in fact was then wired somewhere else. And doing ACH clawback or wire uh, clawback uh, for funds is next to impossible. So in cases like that, I mean, all of a sudden you go from a $2,000 oops to a quarter million dollar oops. Uh, and, and those uh, also tend to be very successful ones. And those are a little more sophisticated than, than uh, you know, somebody with, with terrible English uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, cast a thousand emails out there to see who's going to buy it. So I just, you know, kind of want to cover that a little bit too. So, I mean, they're not all quite as obvious as well. Let me tell you a little bit of the rest of the story before I move on to the next slide for Michael. We see this. Thanks. See you at three. I was meeting my dad at three that afternoon, and he walked in and said, "So, what do you need the Google Play cards for?" Like, I don't know why you bought those or were texting me about them. He said, you emailed me. We quickly figured out what happened. And he immediately called his, uh, the credit card company. And they said, well, was your credit card stolen? He said, no. They said, who made the purchases? I did. He said, that's not credit card fraud. We can't help you. Um, and then called Google. And I actually took over because I wasn't satisfied with their answer. But they just flat out told him uh, pretty much that he was an idiot for falling for it. And Google doesn't do refunds. It's their policy. And I called and you know, eventually spoke with somebody that was a manager. And ultimately, they sent me uh, a link where I could report this to the FBI. But he reiterated, Google doesn't do refunds. And I said, these are all the codes that were used. Certainly, you can reference these with what account they got redeemed on, lock down that account, reclaim the money, and refund my father this money that he got scammed out of. And they said, maybe Walgreens and Safeway will refund your money. And I'm like, they probably make 1% selling those gift cards. Google has the $2,000, less 1%. The beneficiaries of this were Google and the scammer. And Google had no interest in helping to fix this situation. So Google sucks, and I want you all to know that. <laughs> <laughs> don't be evil. Oh, don't be evil, yeah, yeah. You know, when you have an opportunity to do something good and you refuse to do anything, that's a little evil. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a little bit. Can I make a comment on your example? Yes.
Yeah. Yes. And that's when it happens. But one thing for you all to know about cyber liability insurance is back to social engineering, or they call it computer mm -hmm. wire transfer fraud, is a separate limit often yes. than the standard limit. So you have, when you buy a policy like that, you have to know what that limit's going to be if you have that exposure. Absolutely. So my dad bought them on the company's behalf with his own personal credit card, not a company credit card. So it may not have been necessarily covered, I don't think. So tell us about these stats. All right. So uh, again, we're going to reference the, uh, the Verizon data breach incident report uh, uh, this time, the 2018 report, the freshest report they have out. Um, and these, these statistics have actually remained relatively steady. They, they, uh, they waver a couple of percent a year back and forth, uh, depending on, on, on the sample size and breaches that they have. But 73% 70 per, of their breaches th that they've investigated have been perpetrated by outsiders. Um, and so, you know, j just like the couple of examples we just saw, uh, or, you know, hacking into services externally, things like that, that's what would be encompassed in that. <clears throat> 28% of, of, of breaches uh, involved internal actors. And so when you look at that, um, it doesn't mean that 28% of those breaches involved internal actors which committed that breach maliciously. Uh, that also includes people who shared their documents unknowingly or uploaded them to Dropbox and had poor permissions on them. Uh, you know, uh, a good example uh, uh, that you see in the news on the occasion is uh, uh, something getting uploaded to what's called an Amazon S3 bucket uh, that isn't secured by default. And so uh, sometimes those can be a treasure trove of database files and all kinds of other things. Uh, and, and again, due to internal actors not necessarily acting maliciously, but just not necessarily knowing the liability and risk that they're putting the data in. 2% uh, involved partners, 2% uh, featured multiple par uh, 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 parties. 50% uh, of these breaches were carried out by organi organized uh, uh, criminal groups. Um, and I think that that says a lot right there in the fact that uh, apparently it's a little bit of money to be made here, right? Uh, again, you know, we've been talking about ransomware and, and all these other things. Uh, you know. Identity is getting stolen. Uh, I mean, I think I probably at this point have had my identity stolen so many times I have free credit monitoring for life. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of money to be made here. Uh, and, and for them, there's not a whole lot for them to lose, right? Uh, you know, they're usually in, in these countries that uh, if they're cooperating with whatever nation state uh, that they may want uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to fall under, that nation state may just turn a blind eye to all their activities. Uh, and then 12% of the breaches uh, uh, involved actors identified as nation state or state affiliated. So uh, a lot of times the, organi the organized criminal groups and the state affiliated uh, groups have a lot of overlap uh, because they have uh, a lot of the same motives. Uh, just one is financially motivated, the other one uh, is, is nation state motivated. So uh, just some numbers there for you. So on the nation state story, I talked to a guy who did cybersecurity work for, um, for the military, and we talked briefly about the fact that the, the Pentagon got hacked by China. And it was very interesting what he had to say. He said, um, yeah, they, they found some stuff we didn't want them to, but they also found some stuff we did want them to. And so when they're finding misinformation and then accurate information, they can't tell what's what. So when they've stolen plans to a billion dollar jet that won't fly, we kind of just chuckle at that. Yes, sir? Some of the nation state motivation is true. Absolutely. Like in North Korea, yep. they have a, since the sanctions and all of that stuff has been placed on them, mm -hmm. uh, this is public information. Oh, yeah.
Uh, North Korea is just on AOL dial-up still, right? <laughs> no, the one piece is. Oh, I mean, a good example, uh, I mean, uh, what, about two, three weeks ago, a water utility got hit by the Ryuk uh, ransomware, and that one is currently attributed to uh, North Korea, so. So, what tactics are utilized? 40% of breaches uh, featured hacking, uh, which, you know, surprise, right? 30% um, of those included actual malware to uh, uh, go through and, and plant on to, uh, 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 various machines, 17% of breaches had errors as, as casual events. And so uh, going back to the, hey, I didn't realize the spreadsheet I was sharing shouldn't be shared publicly or, you know, things like that would fall uh, definitely under there in the user awareness piece. 17% uh, were social attacks, so uh, some type of, 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 of engineering. 12% uh, involved uh, privilege misuse, and so in those cases, you would find like a system administrator or somebody who has elevated privileges or access to sensitive information uh, misusing their privileges and, and, and causing a breach, uh, usually maliciously in those cases. Um, and then 11% of breaches uh, involved physical actions, so actually uh, installing something on a network uh, you know, stealing a, uh, a laptop that may have, uh, you know, PHI or, or some other type of, of, uh, of protected information on it. Uh, you know, and so uh, those types of things happen. Um, what are the commonalities? So 49% of non-point of sale malware was installed via malicious email. And so uh, point of sale, uh, breaches happen a little differently than uh, traditional system breaches. Uh, but otherwise, almost half of, of, of these, uh, these pieces of malware were delivered via email. And so while we're putting all these, these things into uh, making sure we're scanning our attachments and, and teaching our users to do these things, um, you know, that's still the major entry point for most of this stuff. Uh, 76% of these breaches were financially motivated. Uh, you know, again, showing that, uh, you know, almost 50% of, of, of the groups were, organi were organized crimes, but three quarters of these were, uh, were, uh, were financially motivated. 13% of the brief, uh, breaches were motivated uh, uh, by the gain of strategic advantage and espionage. Um, and so, again, the, the nation state advantage there would definitely fall into this. Um, you know, especially uh, uh, with the Chinese uh, trying to steal uh, intellectual property. Uh, that tends to be one of the really big ones. And then here's, here's a really staggering one. 68% of the breaches that they studied took months to discover. Uh, I want to say the average right now, and it's, I, I'm going off of a memory that's probably nine or 10 months old, but it's something like 21 months uh, from, uh, it, yeah, so. That, <laughs> one day I hope we can say 21 days is the average. Uh, it would be fantastic. So, go ahead. And one of the big things in, in these data breaches uh, that, you know, kept coming up was, uh, you know, people don't understand the information that they have typically in an organization. Data classification is an issue. Uh, you know, as, as an HR organization, you have uh, things that could, uh, could be considered uh, uh, HIPAA information. So your payroll deductions for health insurance are considered HIPAA protected information. I mean, something as simple as that. And so, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, people just don't understand the information that they're being uh, uh, charged with uh, in the disposition and the ways they should handle it. This just has this gal in a coffee shop doing social research, picks a CEO out, does research on their employees, emails the salespeople for information, they gladly give it because that's what salespeople do. Um, and then she sends out a 
uh, an email from the CEO that the email address is almost his, and it's got a, an attachment with uh, malicious payload attached to it. And next thing you know, the company announces they've been hacked and secrets have been stolen and their servers have been encrypted and the stock takes a tumble and the CEO resigns. And the CEO really didn't do any of it, but his name was on those emails. Um, it's a really very interesting video and I'm sorry that the volume's yeah. not good enough here. So, um, but to kind of piggyback on the amount of data that's out there, um, you know, currently out in the cloud, uh, so available on the internet, is 400 exabytes of data. Now, I even have a tough time fathoming how much data that is. It's insane. Uh, one statistic said that, you know, it's, it's a stack of papers from here to Pluto and back like 18 times, which is just absolutely mind-boggling that that amount of, of information is there. And I wonder how many of them are, are cat pictures. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, the theft today, uh, you know, is almost a half a trillion dollars at this point. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about the, the, uh, the uh, um, financial liabilities that are out there with the amount of data that's out there, uh, I mean, all, all of a sudden you start talking real numbers. There's, there's a whole bunch of different numbers out there uh, as, as far as what does a data breach cost an organization. Um, the Ponemon uh, Institute does a study every year. Uh, sometimes they're vendor driven, sometimes uh, uh, not. Um, what, one upside is uh, year over year, the, the cost per record has been driven down uh, in, in the cost of a breach. That's, that's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It means that we're getting really good at these and getting efficient at, at, at remediating, remediating breaches and, and understanding what to do there. But then the downside of that is we're getting really good at this. Um, it, we shouldn't have to be. So uh, on average, uh, $141 per record, uh, and they consider a record uh, the, the unique identifiers of a natural person uh, in this study. 47% uh, of those breaches were caused by hackers and criminal insiders. Uh, the, the remainder of those uh, were, were likely uh, uh, done to uh, either negligence or accidental release, uh, depending on, on what it is. But these costs include from the beginning of the incident all the way to full remediation, legal liability, you know, all the additional fallout. The reason I have credit monitoring for life, right? You know, that's, that's gonna be an ongoing cost for these various breaches. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's on average what that ends up costing uh, an organization. The best way to start to define uh, information security, because it tends to be this nebulous thing for most people, is to place it into the terms of physical security. So prevention, detection, response. You know, they were talking about it earlier as, as well uh, in, in the area of, of, uh, of, of fire uh, prevention, uh, detection, response. Uh, but in the area of protection, we do various things, right? We have doors, we have windows, we have signage saying we have security systems. We have lights to help, help with, uh, with illuminating dark areas. We have a fence to keep people out. Um, and on the cyber side, we have all those, those same types of things uh, as, as part of our defenses. Uh, in detection, uh, you know, we have the signage, so we actually have that security alarm. We have a dog, um, you know video uh, uh, to do detection, uh, a neighborhood watch uh, as, as an overall larger uh, a, a body to support that, uh, and then security monitoring for that security alarm. And then your response, so uh, your, your, uh, your active response things like guns, police, uh, an insurance uh, uh, a policy uh, in case you were to need it, the dog as well, uh, and then you know a little cheeky down here, but a tank, right? You know because everybody wants a tank, so. So uh, the overall goal though uh, in information security is confidentiality, integrity, and, and, and availability. Those are the three core tenets of, 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 of information uh, security in general. So confidentiality, making sure the right people get the right access at the right time and those who shouldn't don't. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's a relatively simple uh, core tenant. Integrity, to make sure that that, in, that that information is true and complete when it's delivered to you. And availability, um, just that, it's there when I need it. So those are, are, are kind of the three, the three core tenants of, of any good information security program. Okay, we're gonna overwhelm you now. Dun, dun, dun. Right. <laughs> so uh, in a previous organization I used to work for, this is, uh, this is a uh, bit of an eye chart. Um, this is what, what an information security posture looks like inside of an enterprise organization. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of, of different products up here. There's a whole bunch of, of, of different uh, you know, moving pieces, but it's all about defense and depth. It's about understanding what your exposure is and what you need to do to ensure you cover it uh, to go through and, uh, and do that. So you know, on the network side, as, as we're looking at it, we've got perimeter security, we've got network security, endpoint application data security. Over here, we have our management and policy uh, stuff inside of prevention. So again, having our policies, having them well-developed, having our users educated on those policies and shockingly actually following those policies, right? Um, and then, you know, security operations, the people part of, of, of a well-rounded security uh, uh, program. So everything from compliance monitoring to incident re uh, uh, response and all those things. So now this is, again, this is an, an, an absolutely monstrous example of what uh, a, def a, uh, a defense in depth model would look like from an information security program. But the point of this being is as an organization, you should really understand the needs of your organization to protect the data you have, to protect the systems you have, to ensure you have the uptime you need, to stay compliant, and to make sure people don't go to jail, right? I mean, of course, you know, none of us want to go to jail. So. All right. <clears throat> so, if you've got, what your businesses need to make sure they're doing as key steps. First of all, like I said, I really recommend every business have a cybersecurity officer in-house to help maintain, maintain that these things are getting followed and improved upon. Cyber insurance, uh, Mary can talk all day about cyber insurance and, and what that covers and why you need it. Physical, physical security, yeah, how often have you uh, seen an unlocked computer? The gentleman at lunch had the example of uh, car dealerships where you've got unlocked computers everywhere and nobody on the f showroom floor. Uh, I've even seen plenty of, of servers that are jammed into closets and then because the servers were overheating, they just leave the closet doors open and I've even seen servers uh, underneath the, the counter as, uh, where the receptionist sits. So, a culture of awareness. We talked earlier about making sure that we had um, the executives in the company really fully buying into this stuff. Uh, they're critical to that culture of awareness along with your cybersecurity officer. Make sure you're following your compliance requirements. Even if you don't have, you're not in an industry that has compliance requirements, it's not bad to adopt one of those standards that are out there, whether that's HIPAA or SEC or uh, NIST. These are all really good frameworks and good best practices for any business. Uh, password management, definitely want to have a tool for that, not just use the same password on every application, every site. Uh, have some written security policies. Key items for your security officer, uh, as far as assigning one, and having a backup cybersecurity officer in your organization. So like I said, one of the things that we provide for our clients is user awareness training. We put the cybersecurity officer in charge of making sure that these things are happening. Everyone's been through the training, and actually part of it, we can also, once everyone's been through the training, send them phishing emails and tell them who clicked on what. Because maybe fun. somebody needs to go through the training again. Um, client security codes over, I'll explain this one really quickly. So I could have a client who fires an employee and that employee then calls in to Amnet to our help desk and says, hi, this is, and they use someone else's name, maybe the CEO, I need help resetting my password. 
And if my people just do that, and we've just given that person VPN access after they're not with the company anymore, that's probably a real problem. Uh, so having some way to verify that the person is who they say they are, they say, okay, great, Mr. CEO, I have on file uh, that your mobile number is this. I'm going to send you a text with four digits. I need you to t read those back to me just to verify. Or for password resets, I'm required to call you back on your mobile number. I'm calling that number now. Um, so good processes to have. As far as this is where I talked about adopting a framework of one of many good frameworks that are out there. Uh, did you want to say anything else about this slide? Um, there are a whole bunch of great frameworks out there. Uh, they're all very overwhelming if you try to eat the entire elephant. Um, you know, if we take uh, you know, NIST 853, the cybersecurity framework as a whole, uh, if you were to read that thing from front to back, you'd throw up. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely overwhelming and completely untenable, especially for a small business to try to consume. And so to go through and uh, you know, either work with a partner, uh, if you have the, 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 uh, uh, the information security talent in-house, by all, by all means do that. Um, but really understand the requirements of your industry vertical and, and, and the compliance requirements that come from that. Because if you decide to adopt HIPAA and you're in financial services, why would you do that, right? So uh, that's, that's kind of my piece on that. All righty. So they're getting, we, we talked earlier about these international bad players being smart and persistent. You need to be vigilant because of that. Uh, it, it's been said that you know, as a cybersecurity professional, you have to be successful on defense 100% of the time, and they only have to get through once. And that's a tough standard to meet, and you've got to be vigilant on that. I love this picture. This is a, a security gate right here. Not too tough to uh, breach that environment. You can tell people have been doing it. So password management, these are some things that every business ought to do. Use a tool, but having it be both easy and secure, honestly, that, that can be tough. And it really takes people just adjusting to the new normal. Who here remembers taking someone to the airport parking your car and going with them to the gate until they boarded their plane. Everybody remember that? No. You wouldn't even think of that today. Security is inconvenient. And it's the new normal. I'll, uh, I'll piggyback on, on the security one real quick. Um, I'm a huge fan of password managers, uh, key pass, last pass. Uh, it's, it's actually the only password I know anymore. I don't know any of my other passwords. Um, and, and even at that, that password is protected by two-factor authentication. So I have to have a, a second method in order to even get into my password vault. Uh, one of the upsides with, with things like that is, uh, you know, if you have a spouse or something like that, if something happens to you, uh, a lot of them have kind of a break glass feature as well to where you can assign them rights uh, to be able to access, uh, you know, chosen usernames and passwords uh, in a shared vault uh, in case something happens to you instead of trying to guess, you know, uh, uh, password bingo with 100 websites, so. Well, talk a little bit more about that with yeah. how that works. Oh, okay, you, so. You, you had a good example yeah. the other day. So, uh, actually, uh, that's why I use LastPass for families. So, uh, you know, uh, me, my wife, my son, all share uh, uh, various passwords. Uh, my daughter here soon as well, She's, uh, uh, she just turned nine. Uh, she doesn't really have a whole lot of need to log into various things. Uh, my son, who's in middle school, starting to access a lot more online resources. But one of the cool things is, is you can assign uh, your spouse or somebody else as, as kind of that, that break glass in case of an emergency. So if my wife were to press the button to request access to my last, to my last pass vault, it notifies me and then waits 24 hours before, or, or, or 48 hours before giving her access to that set of passwords. So, uh, you know, an individual IRA account, you know, something along those lines where, you know, you don't she, she may not necessarily have the capability of having a separate login for that. Uh, you, can, you can maintain those types of things as well. 
and you'll get notified that yep. someone's trying to get that. And if you don't respond, exactly. then she yep. gets access. Exactly. All right. So a little bit about uh, cyber insurance and why you ought to have it. Um, if anybody has a question, I'll probably defer to Mary on this, but it will just help you deal with an incident. Um, and your insurance professional is probably going to be able to tell you what you need based on the type of industry you're in, the, the type of revenue that your company's doing. Um, so these are some of the things that are all a part of that. And I'm not going to read the slides to you, but uh, there's a lot to it. And it's, it's kind of insurance that, regardless of if you've got compliance requirements, it's probably a good idea to add this to what you've got. And actually, you'll be surprised at how reasonable cyber insurance actually is. Wait, 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 wait. Cyber crime and social engineering. Just going to point that one out since it's been a good topic for today. <laughs> so as far as the trends that have been going on, uh, these are the top trends as far as cyber, uh, cyber, cyber insurance claims. So as far as what impacts the premiums, like talked about revenue, type of industry that you're in, those types of things. I'm, I'm going to point out the last one too. So the IT uh, security controls or and controls. So that's the having the policies, having the 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 training, uh, documenting that you're actually you know doing patches, all those things that you know. Uh, from a regulator standpoint or, or a compliance standpoint, they always ask you, are you doing these things? Well, it's you know, then saying, yes, we are doing these things and then proving you're doing them. That's one of the really, really big pieces there uh, that is relatively unique to, to each organization beyond you know, what revenue industry classification, stuff like that is. So I just want to point that out. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can't just write it off and be like, it's okay, I don't need to do anything about this because I have insurance. I, I don't know of an insurer that would actually even like touch you with a 10 foot pole if, if, uh, if they found that out. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yes. That's correct. Um, but yes, getting it, I, yeah. it seems pretty easy. I, medical, financial, those are harder categories, for sure. They do more research on that. Just tell us here the reinsurance and the funding insurance. What type of uh, procedures put in place and what, what
rather than like attaching it to your tax policy? One of the things I'll, I'll add on a little bit. So uh, in, in, in the case that you do make a claim against your cyber insurance, they're gonna do a whole bunch of different things just like they would if you were to make a claim against a fire or something like that. They're gonna send out their own adjusters. Um, in the case of a cyber incident, they may send out their own forensic team uh, or, or work with law enforcement uh, if you've engaged law enfor enforcement as well. And so they're gonna be doing their due diligence on the back end uh, before they actually pay out to make sure that, uh, you know, were you doing the things you said you were doing and, and exercising uh, you know, due care in, 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 in doing those uh, before we actually, uh, you know, write you a check and, and, and move beyond it, so. I, I just, you know, I, so, uh, historically, we're quite a few small businesses, yeah. quite honestly, you know, kind of straight, straight down the list of priorities. Absolutely. And, um, and that's kind of coming upstream in this kind of situation that um, I think it would be a good idea So while we help people with their cybersecurity, it's actually a best practice to have a, a party other than your IT company do that uh, security test. And generally, they're not out to try and burn us and say, this is where you're falling down and, and you're inept. They work with us to then close the gaps. And you know, best practices are constantly evolving as well. And so we've got a couple companies in town that we partner with for that just to make sure that we're doing a good job. If your IT company is saying they did their security scan and you're good to go, um, really best, really best to get a third party opinion on that. And it's a best practice, one that we would prefer to use. Um, exactly. <laughs> yes. That's a good way to put it. Uh, and so there are things that, you know, if you get hacked, like that example, of that woman who hacked the corporation, uh, things like reputation damage that your cyber insurance may cover hiring a PR firm to help fix your trust in the business community. Yes, sir. It seems to be an interesting trend with uh, reputation damage, specifically in the United States. People, consumers just don't genuinely seem to care. Target sales go down. Mm -hmm. Home Depot. Well, major breaches. And even though I, I know the Target thing wasn't this Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's um, an interesting uh, anecdotal story about a, a, a white hat hacker, you know, like Rodney, that certified ethical hacker, where companies will pay them to try and hack their network to either prove that they're vulnerable or hardened. And um, this the story goes that this this hacker who was working anonymously, you know, under a a, a pen name. Uh, <coughs> said, all right, I'll do your, your penetration testing. Your, I'll test your cybersecurity for $10,000, but if I get your data, it's $50,000. And the IT guy was like, oh, we've got intrusion detection and prevention and triple security threats and this on that. And he said, bring it on. And the guy says, all right, I'll be back in 90 days. I'll get back with you guys in 90 days. And um, so, Time comes and goes, and the uh, guy actually shows his face and walks in with a stack of papers and says, here's your, uh, your customer list, their credit card information, all of your employees, their social security numbers, and your invoice for $50,000. And the IT guy is just beside himself. He said, I was keeping an eye on those firewalls, and our, there were no alerts. You did not get through. How did you get this information? And he said, well, you're right. Your firewalls are doing their job. 
but you guys were hiring for a junior accountant. And I applied for and got the job. And one day I brought in my cell phone and plugged it into my computer like I was charging it. And I copied this data over to my cell phone and took it home and printed it out. And the IT guy thought he was cheating. That's not fair. That's not what we expected you to do. He said, but your threats are going to come from the inside more than from the outside. Um, oh, and here's my letter of resignation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can harden your outside, but if you haven't hardened your inside too, um, it's, it's a good best practice to lock down your USB drives on your computers so that they can't access data. Uh, it's inconvenient, like we talked about, but I can't put my thumb drive in to get the Word doc off that I worked at home last night. Find another way. Stop using your personal computing resources for business. Oh, uh, <laughs> one of the other things uh, to your point too is uh, you know the reputation damage. It, do, it doesn't seem to do much, um, but you know one of the other things too with that is is customer churn. You know uh, how hard is it for you to actually acquire a customer and then keep them, and what does that actually cost you overall? And it, you know somebody like a Target, that's much easier because they're a brick and mortar. They're usually conveniently located. You know stuff like that. You know people hate Walmart, so they're going to go to Target instead. Uh, you're going to have all these other factors that play into that, but you know, to your point as well, I, 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 somebody had said small business, um, where you may have one or two locations and your, your cost to acquire a customer is huge, that, that churn could very well kill you. All right, so to wrap up and give you guys some action items, get unwavering commitment from the management at your company to have a culture of safe computing and user awareness training. Get a cybersecurity checklist of things that have to get done to make sure that your network is hardened. It talks about its, its processes, its procedures, but it's also patching, it's backing up, those types of things. Get things hardened. That's firewalls, but also PCs and servers. Uh, create and enforce policies. Way too many Policy books sit gathering dust. Uh, great, we created it, but we don't know what's in there. Um, get a cybersecurity audit. Guarantee you, you have gaps. Right now, any small business has got gaps. Consider cybersecurity insurance and stay informed. The information you get today will not be completely relevant a year from now. You have got to stay vigilant on learning this stuff. And you do not have to be an IT person or a security expert to make sure that you've got people who are doing things smartly in your organization. So now, I know we've kind of had questions throughout. Are there other questions or comments you guys would like to make? Yes, please. So we looked at the detection depth map. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, re it's, it's a really good point, point. Um, and I've, I've I've argued for the last few years that the traditional network edge is dead. Um, you know, we now need to manage our security postures with identity. Uh, and so, can I trust who you are, using the device you're coming from to access the data you're asking for? Um, and can I deliver that in a secure fashion um, is, is, is really kind of the new question. It's not that I have this, uh, you know, moat and wall security perimeter around my, my, uh, my four walls as an organization. And so really to your point, um, you, you know, uh, continuing to push uh, data encryption, not only at rest, uh, so making sure my laptop is, is encrypted, but then also making sure that uh, if, if I am uh, accessing a website, I'm doing uh, so securely, so it's over HTTPS, so that data in transit is also secured. Um, I also think one of the really, really important things that we didn't mention here is, uh, and 
you delve a lot into it, especially as you get into large organizations, is third-party risk management. Um, and so uh, uh, managing the risk that your external vendors uh, hold for you. So your email provider, uh, if, you're, if you're using payroll services, say you're using check systems or, or whoever it happens to be for, uh, uh, for doing payroll, have you actually ensured that uh, you know, not only are you uh, taking due care with the data you have, but that you can also validate that they're also doing the same. So uh, ha have you asked them, hey, what do you guys do around security? Do you, ha do you, do you have a general security package you can deliver us uh, around X, Y, or Z? And most of the larger, more mature organizations, especially if they're in financial services or healthcare, will absolutely have, have a package. Sometimes they'll require you to sign an NDA with them, but they'll deliver you a package of what their, their security audits and, and ongoing best practices are. And so, uh, you know, as you start looking for all those soft, squishy places in your organization and where your risk actually lies, um, no longer is it really around that firewall and the perimeter of the network, but it starts becoming, you know, am I managing identity correctly? Am I delivering data correctly? Am I doing so securely? Um, you know, and then extending that out to, you know, your, your third party partners as well. So I think the yeah, beginning of sorry. her question though was, how do we educate the public? Not what are our best practices. Oh, and I, oh I know. Do. So and, and how do we so disseminate this information so that people actually are more aware and better are better at being secure? Um, people hate talking security, and and uh, it's sexy. Uh, well, to to a point, but but you know when 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 the news cycle lives off of thirty second sound clips, it's it's really a hard thing. It's much easier to broadcast the despair of things that are going on than it is to actually educate somebody on, on, on how to do something correctly. And so if we keep talking about it, if we, uh, you know, from, from a compliance standpoint, I mean, if you look at, at, at PCI or any of the other audit frameworks, they're starting to address a lot of those other things beyond, you know, hey, uh, is my baseline configuration on this, this computer uh, solid, you know, starting to go into some of those other things. And so, Educating the public as a whole, I think, is, is, is definitely a hard task to do, but I think you'll see some traction if we keep talking about it, if we uh, incorporate it into more and more of the frameworks, and it just becomes one of those things that's always in your face. You know, we know going through TSA at the airport, unless you've got pre-check, you take your laptop out of your bag. You can only have three ounce uh, containers of, of liquids. You have to take your shoes off. You have to take your belt off. We've learned some of those things because we've done them repetitiously. Doing these things repetitiously, being vigilant about following the processes that have been outlined, um, mm -hmm. I think is probably the way that we have to go and just be good at it. Sir? So to that point, though, I mean, that's if you want to fly a plane. There's still options. You can drive, you can take a train, you can take a bus, you can walk, for God's sake. But if you want to take a plane, Okay, we're taking away your internet until you behave. <laughs> Dang it, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> and your birthday, too. All right. <laughs> That's all we have today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we welcome your feedback on this. I think that the um, SBDC is going to be asking for your feedback on the sessions. So please, good or bad, Constructive feedback, we appreciate it. If you think there's something we could have covered better or didn't cover, uh, please let me know. And if you want some more details about uh, like checklists and best practices, get a card from me and I'll be happy to share that. So thanks all. all right.